guys for both for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Looks like we got a great yeah. turnout from the audience. Amazing turnout. Um, so I wanted to just talk about you know, some of the changes and what it means to be a great product leader today with each of you. The first question, Sarah, is for you. You know, you've had multiple roles both on the operating side in product uh, and in venture capital. How has, how has each of those prepared you for the other one? So how has becoming, being a product person prepared you to become a great VC and vice versa? Yeah. Well, so look, there's definitely superpowers that you develop in each of those jobs that make you stronger in the other one. But one of the things that really surprised me when I made that switch in both directions was that there are really two big parts of being a VC and a product manager that are actually the same skill that basically translate pretty directly. The, the first is the analytical process that you go through as a product leader when you're trying to figure out whether we should ship, ship something, and as a VC when, when you're figuring out whether to invest in a company. And it's basically like you are creating a list of hypotheses. You know, you have, as a, as a VC, you're thinking about the, the product, the team, the competitive landscape, you're talking to customers, and you have all these, you know, the hypotheses that as you prove them out, if they follow, then you're going to do the thing that, it, that is at the end of that conclusion, which is invest. And it's very much the same thing when you are a product leader. You have hypotheses that you prove out with data, with user research, with experiments that you do. And if those things bear out, then it means you should ship the product. And so that's an analytical training that you get in both jobs that really translates. The, the second thing is, like, as I'm sure you guys all experience every day, as a product leader, you never get to tell someone what to do. You know, <laughs> like I'm sure there there are many times when I want to just tell my engineering lead, like just do it. Dude, just do um, yeah. And the same thing, like when you're a VC, uh, you you know you have many times when you are either with your partners or you're on the board of a company, and you want to just say, let's just do this. But you have no one, there's no one that reports to you. There's no one that will do what you say. And really what you have to do is you have to use your communication skills, your powers of persuasion and, and influence to get the outcome that you want. And so it's like, to me, it's no surprise actually that a lot of product leaders end up going into venture because that's one of those intangibles that's really, really hard to find. And you see it in the best product leaders and it's, absolutely critical to the process of convincing your partners to invest in a company and then you know working with the founder as a board member and trying to get to the outcome that you want yeah so it's a lot of about you know how do you influence indirectly without any ability to actually do things that's yourself right. that's right yeah what about yourself eric you know you've had a career that's you know you've been in multiple roles in product marketing you know as a ceo yourself um, what have you seen in common that the great product leaders that you've worked with have had, especially versus like, you know, say other functions like marketing or, you know, more general business roles. It's interesting, they're, they're just building on something that, that you guys were just talking about. It's all indirect, right? And so one of the consistencies of all the roles I've ever had is I've never actually produced any work product. <laughs> um, something, it, it's astonishing, 20 years into a career and never actually having produced any work. And, and, and so it, it's, it's one of these really interesting things where, so what do you want to do? You're influencing people, but it's, not, it's more than influencing in the sense like all, there are all these characterizations of what a great product leader is. The CEO of the product, the owner of the product strategy, you hear things like that. The th the, the phrasing that always resonated with me the most was um, the owner of a unique definition of a problem worth solving. Yeah. And so each of those pieces is really important, a unique definition of a problem worth solving. And, and, and the way I think about that is if as a product leader you have a unique definition of a problem worth solving, then it unlocks all the avenues in the creative's minds. In, in the software case, it's designers and engineers. It unlocks all the, the avenues in their minds to come up with a really incredible solution, an innovative solution. And, and as a product leader, I think it's not about coming up with the solution, but it's about unlocking that potential and, and helping the creative solve a problem that's actually worth solving. And, and, that's, and it's really interesting related to marketing, because having gone from product management to marketing, and back and forth a couple times, both jobs are fundamentally reliant on communication. 
right? You have to be able to communicate great. But it's all about what do you optimize for. In, in product management, it's really important to optimize for correctness. All the nuance, all the details, everything else, it's really important in what that definition is and what you're trying to do. In marketing, it's most, it, it's most important to optimize for clarity. The simplicity of what you're trying to say really, really matters. Um, and, and, and relatability. And so those are, those are, it's the same job in the sense that they're both communication-based and they're both about unlocking potential. The, the, it's just all about what do you optimize for and what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, that's one of the big things that we focus on at Amplitude uh, in terms of what we think about a product's role in the company, which is uh, product's job is to really define the problem, uh, not the solution. And so, you know, mm -hmm. kind of leave it up to the engineering or the designing team to think totally. about what, what great solution looks like. Um, so it's, yeah, less that CEO of the product and more about, hey, you're the owner of the problem. Um, Eric, from your time at Opsware and Rockmelt, how have you seen the product development world evolve around the role of product management? How has it changed over time, you know, over the last two decades? I mean, there's a lot of little differences in uh, tool sets, you know, communication tools, data, like there's a bunch of little differences in that. But I think the, the single overarching difference is the operating cadence of product teams. The product teams used to um, operate like at Opsware, we would have a major release once a year and a minor release in between major releases. Yeah. And I mean, if it, that's just completely foreign to probably everybody in this room, but that, that's on-prem software, that's how everybody did it at the time. And so that operating cadence is really, really different. And now the operating cycles are so iterative and, and, and adaptive that you have the feedback loops are tighter, the communication loops are tighter, the like correcting of mistakes can be much tighter. So like all of these things are, are, are much tighter than they used to be, but you always have to worry about like, you know, racing up a, lo a local maxima at the same time, which is something that yeah. we worry about a lot less. What, um, I'm curious, how, that, how has that, what does that mean for what it means to be a good product manager now? Is that about you know, being really responsive and in the moment, or are the core still, still, still the same? I think there's just an element of it where you can't lose, it, it, it's, it's really great. In general, I think it's like a super, super positive change. Um, but the thing that you have to watch out for is um, losing the forest for the trees um, as, yeah. you're, as you're iterating that quickly and, and, just, and being immediately responsive. Wait, what are we trying to do? What problem are we trying to solve? Is it worth solving? Um, and have we, have we characterized the problem correctly? What about, so what's one of the interesting things that we've seen at Amplitude is that, you know, just like you talked about, the building a product side has become a lot higher resolution and faster and more iterative and kind of more responsive to the needs of the market. Um, what would you say uh, on the kind of understanding the user side, especially when it comes to data? Um, that's been, you know, obviously what Amplitude is built around. And one of the biggest changes that we've seen is that access to see how users are actually using your product is a new thing, especially, you know, compared to something like an on-prem piece of software where it's like you deploy the thing and you have no idea how it's being used. How has that impacted the role of uh, product people? I mean, Sarah and I were talking about this the other day. It's like, uh, you know, I mean, it's actually kind of simple. At Opsware, we had no data. I mean, you guys take for granted, like, you see how many users. We had no idea how many users we had. We had no idea what those users were doing in the product. Like, we, it was just, it's like a, you ship it, you do surveys, and, like, you, you get little you did bits. Do, you did do some, like, you know. Yeah, yeah, you do some stuff, and you build, and we had a, a little bit of stuff that we built over the time, but it's just, like, there was, it was so much more a guessing game uh, than, than it is today. Um, it, whereas every product team, that we work with today, like you'd be even in a in a Series A presentation for anybody who has a launched product, you would expect them to have some understanding and some actual data of like what people are doing in the product. I mean, like the thing I'd add is, you know, I think about the phases that we went through at Pinterest, where in the beginning we had no data, and in yeah. some ways that was actually good because in the beginning, your the surface area of the product is so small that if you start relying too much on data 
you end up optimizing for a local maxima. And so you really have to start with first principles and kind of think about what are the things I have to build in order to expand that surface area. And then you get to a phase where you start to have data. And then the question is, well, what are the trade-offs that I make with that data? Like, what's actually important for us to, to watch? Like, when we did an experiment at Pinterest and it drove up repins, but follows or likes went down, like you need someone who's going to figure out, and again, this comes from a first principles perspective of like, well, what are the right trade-offs and what are yeah. the things that we should really be tracking? And then you get to the third phase where you've figured out, and I think the product team largely is the one driving this, what are the things that we should be making trade-offs? What what's the metrics that we really do care about? And then you get to a point where if you are only deciding product from a first principles perspective, what ends up happening is that you get too driven by your own usage of the product, which is that yeah. you're a power user. Right. And so you, you have like a very, very narrow view of how people use a product, which is your own usage of the product, which isn't all your users. And then you're also optimizing for the feature that you're responsible for. And right. you don't want, you know, as they say, you don't want the org chart to show up in the product in that the you're product. building. Yeah, <laughs> and so what ends up happening is that you have to use data to give you that global view of what are the trade-offs we should be making now <clears throat> at the system level of our product, and then also the trade-offs we should be making for you know, that power user that you have versus the new users that you want to get. And it's really, those trade-offs are really, really tricky, and you have to make it using user research, using your first yep. principles, using the data that you have, um, and that's, that's, a, that's really core to what the product manager does. I see. So Go ahead. This, I was just going to add to this because I think Sarah's articulation of this like first principles and how you like interweave the two or something that that sometimes we feel gets lost. Like I, I think I'll talk about investing for a second because it's related. Similarly, when you were making a, a Series A investment in in 1998, like there was no data um, in, in general and. Um, today, venture capitalists have tons and tons and tons of data, just like yeah. product managers have tons and tons of data. And I think one of the things that we have to be careful of in that, and you see um, new entrants often make this mistake, is an over-reliance on the data yeah. um, without the corresponding hypothesis. What's yeah. actually happening? Um, so it's really important that we have the data, but it's also really important that we have the analysis and the hypotheses, which is like, why is the data doing yeah. that? What's actually driving it to be like that? And I think one of the things that can be lost right now, it, to take the investing world, is like, hey, it's like the magic number looks like this, and like this random metric looks like this, and net retention looks like this, and, and they've completely lost the f taste or feel for what's actually happening and um, it's just a recipe for stupidity. Yeah, and just to <laughs> build on that, I think what is so hard is that there's so many times when you want to optimize for one thing, so magic number, as an example, or you, know, you hear the customer support request all the time, and if you are just optimizing for that one thing, then you go down a rabbit hole that's just very dangerous for your company and the product, and so it is always about how do you balance all the different opposing forces that you, that you get as inputs to get to the right you know, global decision. So it, it sounds like you guys view the role of data as just another channel for coming up with those assumptions or validating them or testing them uh, when it comes to understanding the problem. Yeah, it's definitely like you don't want to be a slave to the data, but you also can't ignore it. It has yeah. to be a really important input. Yeah. One, one of my favorite things that I've heard about uh, Ben, the CEO at Pinterest, that he would sign up for an account as a new yes. user like every month yep. just to understand what the experience looked like. Yep. And it's so important to do that because the your users change as yeah. like the type of user who you the get user changes. Is. Yeah, yeah, who the user is changes. And then also there's these silent things that change in the product that you may that you're just not aware of. You're kind of oftentimes as a product manager, you're just the the frog being boiled. And <laughs> there's these changes that happen that you want those snapshots to see what's actually happening under the hood that creates that difference in experience. Yeah. So Sarah, what would you think are the new challenges for product managers in the coming year, especially as you know, more and more of like your user base is changing, your products are just becoming more global? What, what does that mean for the skills a product manager has to have? Yeah, it's interesting. Like, what I think about a lot is, um, you know, I talked about those three phases that we went through at Pinterest where 
um, of our kind of data evolution. And the last one was, you know, being able to have the global view of the product system uh, versus just like the little thing that you're working on, the feature you're working on. And, and just given how powerful some of the products have gotten um, that we use every day, Facebook, YouTube, even I would say Tesla, <clears throat> if you're just optimizing Yeah, that's them, now a digital product too. It's, yeah. yeah, it's mm -hmm. not, but like you think about so many of the things that they, they, they oh, well, it is digital, it's like, it's this hybrid and you think about so many of the decisions that those engineers are making about, you know, whether to hit the person that has a helmet versus the person who doesn't, you know, like there's like, <laughs> there are crazy decisions that when you talk to engineers at those companies they're having to make every day, you have to start taking this view that's even outside of your product which is not the data that you can see and, and optimize for, but that global view. And I, you know, I was responsible for our home feed as an example at Pinterest. And when you do personalization, you start to get a very narrow view of what that experience is for that one person, and you lose the forest for the trees, which is like the, the global view. And I think that's a really tricky uh, transition that product people have to start thinking about. Do, do you have any examples from your time at Pinterest where you guys went through oh. like, oh, our users actually this when we thought it was this? I mean, there's, there's, so, there's so many, it's because you, and again, what's really hard about personalization is that the only way for you to actually evaluate whether something is personalized is for your own experience of it. Yeah. Right, like I can't look at your home feed and be like, "This is, is a great, yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is a great experience for Spencer because I don't know you." Yeah. And so I have, to, I do it for myself, and it creates blind spots where there were, you know, there were times when we would make a change that we thought we were like taking guns out of the outdoor, you know, recommendations, and it was actually hurting the experience for other people in the feed because they. They wanted, you know, if their zombie apocalypse board that had guns <laughs> on it was actually something yeah. that they really it cared about. To them. Yeah, it yeah. was important to them when yeah. my own view of it was like, oh, that's not a good experience. And so it's, it's those weird trade offs that you have to make. Yeah. The, the last question I wanted to ask you guys um, before we wrap up is uh, talk to me about competition. You know, especially these days, even at Amplitude, we see there are a lot of companies that. Um, where you know you'll come out with a great product idea or you know a new version of a product, and then you see a lot of other companies freely copying those ideas from their more innovative mm -hmm. counterparts. So, what does that mean for you know for those companies and how the landscape is going to shake out? I mean, take the most extreme example of that. Like, just like it's one of these. If you take something to its logical conclusion. Uh, if you take copying to its logical conclusion, what do you get? Rocket Internet. <laughs> um, so uh, for those of you who don't know, Rocket Internet's this uh, company in Germany that basically copies. They, they see something working. They see an Airbnb or Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever, uh, eBay working, and then they just like literally copy it uh, for, that, for that local market. And, and they've done this a number of times, like a dozen plus times. Um, and, and, and so that's the kind of logical extreme. And I think what, what, they, what you'll see if you actually look at it, and Sarah's the one who pointed this out to me, is you'll see that there's a bunch of transactional products uh, that they've created where it's like e-commerce-y and you can fuel it with ad spend and there, there's no kind of brand loyalty where that actually worked really well. Like they found a seam yeah, in the market and it, and, and it worked and they bought success. Um, Anything that actually had a fundamental network effect or like a core communication between participants, they couldn't force it and they all failed. And, and so I think there's a, there's a real important takeaway from that, which is it's really important to both understand and be intellectually honest about what your moat is. Like what is the moat for your product? And you need to really understand that. And I think what you end up finding is that having a few good product ideas, as Rocket Internet did, they copied ideas that were working, that is not sufficient. Um, you need to have the systems that enhance and enhance your moat and deliver sustainable growth. And like that's, a, that's much bigger than just having a few product ideas. Yeah, so it's one thing to just copy a piece of software, but it's another totally. to, you know, the whole community, which is you could view as part of the product as well. Absolutely. All right, well, guys, thank you very much for joining us and helping us kick off our conference. Really appreciated thank time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Good to see you. Thanks, man. Appreciate it.